Thanks very much for inviting us. Anyway, um, I haven't produced any slides because I thought we we just we just talk through what we're doing because it's um it's a it's a relatively new new project that we just started. Like I say, we're in the mobilisation phase at the moment. So, um, Ards, do you want to talk over the main aspects of the of the project first? I can start, uh, Karen, and you can jump in, and others can just ask questions. Um, Indeed, it's a new project, and it's a project funded by UK government through their uh, research and innovation arm, if you want. Um, and it will be a three-year-long project where about 10 people will look at agency in the internet. And um, you cannot do the justice of technologies like myself, but you need people from all kinds of disciplines. So there will be um, a postdoc in legal uh, aspects, in business aspects, in culture, in design, and then a number of computer scientists who are interested in elements of AI and elements of cybersecurity and Internet of Things. And all these people will come together. Uh, after we have hired them in the, in the current uh, period, they will all come together and work on a number of case studies where we want to explore agency and how agency relates to online harm and to uh, a feeling of safety on, on the internet. Um, we, um, let me see, we do that mostly, and this is now I'm gonna, sort of say how we're going to do that, because it's just um, just started, as, as uh, Karen already explained. Uh, we're going to do this mostly around four case studies. And these case studies are the smart home. And uh, where does the data go uh, in the smart home? How do you keep control over your data? Uh, elements like that. How do you make it safe for the elderly, etc.? Uh, if they are in very smart homes of the future. Um, a second case study is around identity management. Uh, we will look at distributed architectures where you are, um, you have uh, sovereignty over data, as many of you online know very well. Uh, we're going to look at um, how people can use such technologies in a productive manner and can maintain control over their data. Um, that is stored on these uh, decentralized architectures. Um, a third uh, case study is um, fake news. We'll work with the BBC on that one um, and uh, discuss issues around misinformation, disinformation, um, not only in news, but also, for instance, in the financial industry, where there's a lot of playing with information to make things happen that have some business advantage to individuals. Um, and we are looking into that. Um, and a fourth case study, and Karen now has to help me what the fourth case study is. Do you remember? <laughs> well, Karen doesn't know either, it seems. So we, we'll keep it with three case studies. If it comes back, it comes no, back. No, pers it's personal well-being and health. So it kind of links uh, yeah, to the yeah, that's, technologies. Yeah. And this is particular technologies um, that um, you use through apps and through uh, One of these. Uh, oh, small well. devices, <laughs> fabs, etc. And we're particularly interested in the area of uh, female health technologies. And we work with um, Swiss Precision Technologies, uh, a company that, that is strong in uh, various female uh, female oriented health products. Um, as you see in all those in all those four case studies, we work with significant partners. Uh, so BBC, Swift Health, um, we work with um, uh, companies like uh, Yoti, we work with uh, uh, consumer organizations, we work with local organizations, we work with organizations with women that are subject to domestic violence, uh, mostly women, but actually people in general, um, where we want to get all those players together 
and then in a co-design manner, look at what the challenges are for female health technologies, for smart house homes, for distributed um, uh, decentralized identity and for uh, misinformation. And so this co-design is absolutely critical. Uh, we don't, like in the old days, in the 90s, when I was a PhD student or even earlier, um, we would just design things and throw them at the market. Uh, that is no longer the case and cannot, uh, cannot be sustained. You need to work with the lawyers, with the business people, with uh, the people that look at, at cultural impact and psychological impact. And so co-design is at the center of, of this work. I think that's all I wanted to say. Um, it's sort of a, an introduction to it, but maybe there's more to say, Karen, from your perspective, or maybe people have questions. That they can come yeah. A bit. Um, I suppose it's, it's split into work packages as well. So we've got we've got different people from different disciplines. But what I'll be focusing on particularly is, is taking into account the the current regulations and and legislation that's coming out of the FCA and the government. So for instance, I was speaking at an event early this week and it was talking about the consumer duty from the FCA, which is looking at how do you ensure that what you're communicating to the end user is actually interpretable and trustworthy and will be updated on an ongoing iterative basis. So that again links into looking at misinformation, how often people are checking for vulnerabilities and whether their communication can be understood clearly. I, again, not sure how they're going to enforce that or actually police it online, but at least the inference is they're shifting the responsibility to a company, which is, is one of the areas I'm really interested in and focusing on at the moment, which is corporate digital responsibility. So saying that rather than the end user being responsible for what happens to them online, it moves to say that organizations now have to look internally and say, what are we doing within and by our organization around data and digital? So this links into what you're looking around with trust over IP. So saying that we need to look from the C-suite to, to the operations, operations back to the C-suite and make sure the communication and the responsibility is there throughout. And if not, then they need to, they need to be careful what they're doing when they're reporting around, say, ESG, SDG outcomes and link into, like you say, this, the, the project that we're doing now has links into the online safety bill, which is probably many of you know on the call has some flaws in it, as does other um, reports, etc., from the EU around data and AI and responsible innovation. And there's lots of crossovers and overlap between all of those. So what I want to do as part of the project is sort of map out where we've got all these different regulations and white papers and reports coming out and see where we've got the boundaries over responsibility, who's going to take responsibility. To explain CDR in a nutshell, in the middle of it, sounds quite coy, is purpose and trust. So it's shifting the needle to say, you can make a profit, but it should be around purpose-driven um, objectives in the organization using data and digital technologies and ultimately the goal is to protect the consumer at the other end so we're not doing any of the unintended consequences that we we talk about and that goes across the social the economic and the environmental domains that they will have an impact on as a company and how that ties in nicely with the consumer duty is it seems the fca are pushing that way as well saying if you want to operate in the financial services area you've got to be aware of what you're doing around around these sort of different responsibilities and also if we um think about the new ISO standard out for consumer vulnerability coming out as well. So there's lots of focus on this area that we can explore within this actual project. And then another work package that I'm involved in is looking at law and the ethics around the use of AI, machine learning, and working with colleagues in law to say, how, how, how is the law gonna cope with it? As I said before, with this consumer duty, how are they going to enforce it? What will fines look like? Because the IOC have sort of been semi-successful in doing this, but also fell foul of the law. And then finally doing a cost-benefit analysis with um, some of my former colleagues from Durham University to say, what does it look like for organizations? What's the pain point for them if they, if they don't actually take this into consideration? 
and look at trust over IP and what they're delivering from a consumer perspective, particularly around vulnerable customers, then how much is that going to cost them in terms of profit and hitting them in the pocket where it really hurts? And I think that's why it's quite exciting to be at the outset of that, because there's all, all these different regulations and proposals and bills and white papers coming up and various different continents have got different takes on that. Like I say, the EU is slightly different to the US. The UK will do something slightly different now. We've got the B word, we're, out, we're through Brexit. So it'd be slightly different. But I think what our project can do, liaising with groups like yourself and others, is have, as I've said, this co-creation at the center of it. We don't want to replicate what you're doing in this group, but we want to learn from you to see how we can inform our case studies on identity management and then make a good case to present across a range of stakeholders. And as I said, the good thing that we're doing is we've won this other funding for five years to build an actual network in FinServe and FinTech. That's where we've been focusing in the past before. And that will allow us to co-fund um, projects which you can actually apply for yourselves with academics. So one of my first tasks of that project that launched in September is to map out where the academics are who are working in this area, but also which companies would like to join together and put in a bid. So we've got various projects across seed funding, feasibility studies. Um, agile sprint studies, impact, and then some educational studies, which are, again, are all around co-creation, bringing industry and academia together so we get the benefits of both. And I think that's quite exciting to link to agency as well, because what we're covering here and what you're doing in, in the group is very much around the key sort of wicked problems that we're facing at the moment that people want to make a profit, but the profit has to have a purpose, but also we need to ensure that we think through sort of ethics by design at the beginning of the design phase, and then we try to avoid the unintended consequences of producing something that produces these complex harms at the end, which a government really don't want to see. So it's okay. I think Judy is making a comment as you're typing, Nikki, <laughs> that we can see it and it's maybe a bit distracting, but... Um, like art, I mean, we maybe probably haven't got 45 minutes to fill at the moment with our talk because it is it is so new, but we would welcome sort of questions, what you think about this. Um, I mean, I liaise with, with uh, uh, people in industry quite a lot. That's how I know Nikki, because I used to be in industry before I was in academia, and art's also got experience in industry as well as working in academia. So we're very keen to have that synergy between theory and practice. I don't know if anybody's got any questions or suggestions or. I, I, uh, this is Vikas. I have one question and uh, maybe two comments here. Um, <clears throat> so first, uh, uh, Karen, I applaud you on this this whole effort and Ad, uh, you know this is this is great. Uh, uh, as I introduce myself, I I'm a founder of a, a new startup. So uh, you mentioned that you are going to have a cross industry collaboration in this. Uh, so I was wondering how my startup could participate along with you. Uh, once you start learning about uh, Wapti technologies, uh, you will learn that you know it is very much aligned with the vision that you are also portraying over here. So, so we can have a side discussion on that front, but uh, would love to see how we can participate. Uh, and. Uh, uh, so that was the question. Uh, the, the common part is that uh, you uh, said uh, something about the consumer side of the things, uh, consumer and users and stuff like that. So, uh, which is very appreciable. You, you are, you're trying to protect the consumers here. And uh, as, as part of, uh, in fact, uh, some of the work that we have done with the Wapi technologies, we have kind of taken a very human centric approach. <laughs> Uh, rather than thinking of people as consumers and, uh, you know, they, they have to consume something or they have to become customers of something before they actually start uh, getting the benefits of safety and protection and stuff. Uh, so we want to see it from the perspective of, you know, how, how can those benefits be upfront, even if they are not, uh, you know, uh, mm. paying consumers or paying customers, uh, et cetera. Mm. Uh, so, so uh, in fact, we we went ahead and uh, formulated as uh, that as one of our uh, architecture principles, uh, human centricity. Uh -huh. uh, so, uh, so I just wanted uh, to highlight that 
um, and maybe suggest uh, some alignment there. I, 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 I do not want you to carry on with that, but or, or rather, I'm not um, saying that you know you should, uh, but uh, some, some, some of some, some of the suggestion there. Um, yeah, and, no, and, I mean maybe it didn't come out in that. I was using consumer more because of the the acts that are coming out. But I'm actually a, an ambassador for the Digital Poverty Alliance, so I always start with people, and I sort of say there's two stages at the moment. There's the people who are kind of an ele a white elephant in the room when you go to many meetings, they're not connected, they don't have the skills, they're sort of ignored by industry. So Ad will back me up on here that I'm quite passionate about getting the human first and then the tech as enabler, because my background's in behavioral psychology and sociology once I transitioned to Durham University. So maybe that didn't come out, but I am definitely with you on that, that it's people first and then technology is just an enabler and working around that. So yeah, we we definitely have that focus in the project. Maybe just using consumer duty, et cetera, it's just got a bit sort of mixed up in the it, translation it there. So, so much in the regulations as well. So Karen, yeah. that, that, that's how it has become, right? Even GDPR is calling out for consumer and everything. And uh, I mean, uh, we have kind of taken a left, left uh, uh, side approach, you know, it's like left turn kind of an approach here. And we're just going on with that term, um, and not, yeah, nothing about nice, what you said uh, over here. I, I got the message that you were portraying, and and I think yeah. you. So 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 on that. Uh, thank so, you so much. For that. Yeah. Maybe I I could react as well because I, I like it very much the way you you, you put it, Vikas. Um, and I was. Um, it strikes me though that that in fact even though the terminology is not always sort of human-centered, the more consumer, customer-centered. Um, some elements of, for instance, GDPR, most definitely ethically sort of, sort of follow that same path in that you shouldn't be allowed to um, stop people from getting some service because they don't want the data to be shared, right? And so you have to still, still do it. And so uh, in that sense, um, there is some recognition for, for that viewpoint also in GDPR and in, in uh, AI regulations that are coming up. It's very similar as well. Uh, but it's a very powerful way of, of, of putting it the way you did it, Mikas. Um, in terms of how companies and other partners can work with projects like ours, um, I think let's talk about this research project called Agency. There, um, we will organize workshops around uh, the case studies, and then we will identify what research we want to do. Uh, these workshops we will organize uh, after the summer, once we have the postdocs on board. Um, and there, uh, we are very happy to invite anybody here on this, in this call, for instance, uh, to join. We will not open it up to everyone because the workshops need to be focused. And so we need to get results out of that in terms of a research agenda for the next three years in those case studies. Um, so that uh, most definitely, uh, we will uh, get uh, contact information from Nikki, for instance, and uh, then we can connect with you with that. That's for the research project. In terms of the network around financial services here in the UK that Karen and I uh, will lead, um, uh, there, we will have a membership of as many companies as possible, and there will be uh, events and podcasts and uh, uh, all kinds of ways in which we want to work with industry. And the partnerships are extremely important there. Um, and so there, uh, most definitely, just in general, we want to set up that ecosystem of um, uh, researchers and innovators uh, that have sort of an academic element to uh, to their work as well and an academic interest and so that would be very important for for all of us to be involved in um, so we, we haven't started it yet but that will come out in September and we will let you all know what's going on yeah. thank, thank you so much Ad and Karen thank you now, thanks for your point, because it is, it is one of the passions of mine, as Nikki knows, that's how we kind of met, that it's it's about people first and, and the tech second, so. Yeah, I'm just going to post uh, a link to uh, in fact, uh, my, my status website. Uh, we have encoded them into five architecture principles, um, and 
Ad, I saw in your profile that you are very much interested in distribution and you will see a distribution word over here as well. And you are very much inclined towards cybersecurity. Uh, so would love to have a side chat with you on those aspects. Yeah, most definitely, Mika. So the way we set up this, um, this research project with the work packages that Karen mentioned, the first one is a human-centered work package with a design uh, view. The second one is decentralized architectures, like I see here on your webpage. And then the third one is law, business, and culture, and those elements. And that's how these three work packages sort of are uh, divided up, but then come together, of course, in the actual research. Yeah. So it all fits very nicely, yeah? yeah. Awesome, thank you. Anybody got any further questions? They'd like to ask or comments? <laughs> I've got a, a couple of questions that I've been storing up for you guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really interested in this, your perspectives on, on the term agency and its relationship with free will because kind of baked into some of the principles around SSI and decentralization is this uh, kind of as assumption, underlying assumption or perception that we're all kind of individual free agents. And I, ju I just was interested in your perspectives on the relationship between free will online and agency online. Yeah, they're some of the key things we've actually written in the proposal saying because we're all coming out from different perspectives and different disciplines, we need to also look at what, what does that mean, exploring it. Because like I say, if you go from a sociological perspective, it's do you go down the um, functionalist route? Are we all part of structural functionalism so we don't have that much agency? Or is it agency where we do have an autonomous ability to choose, but within reason? Or is it something else? Because somebody from the humanities has a very different perception of, of agency, et cetera. And then how does that play out on online life? You know, do, do we really have a sense of agency or we nudged? Is a dark tracing that's at work? These sorts of things are what we've discussed in the groups. So we will look at, just as you say, Nikki, what is agency and how do we try to interpret that? It was a bit like with the Fin Trust project. There's concepts of trust from a sociological and business point of view. There's also trust in how it manifests itself in technology. And we're doing a similar sort of thing here, working together as a group to go, that very question, what is agency? How, how does it play out on an online place? Because it's hard to define. Um, we also need to make that we've got an all compassing definition that we can actually work around and, and pursue it. So it's it's an apt question that we've been asking ourselves as part of the group, Nikki. So um, again, watch this space because we're just at the start of exploring and getting everybody's different perspective from law. You know, what yeah. is agency in law? What is agency in ethics? And then how does that translate on, you know, what Farid, you recall being having an online life? Does that change? Because you know you can put all sorts of psychological theories behind that, nudging sentiments online to, to push you away. How do the algorithms then work? Do the algorithms remove agency to a certain extent and force us down this route? These are the sort of things that we'll, we'll be exploring and I hope that some of us, you, you will join us on that because you might already be further down the track than we are and we don't want to reinvent the wheel, but then we can bring you in and go, okay, how have you termed agency? Is this how you see it? If not, how, how do we bring that in and incorporate it in what we're trying to do to come up with the term agency? Yeah, no, absolutely, Nikki. That's very interesting because um, we we mostly look at agency as a, a sort of a notion that says you're in control of what's happening. And you take that a step further uh, in terms of free will, free will. And um, uh, that is very interesting. And I, we, we didn't, we didn't, we, we, in fact, if you look at control, it's a more passive, uh, more defensive way of looking at agency as opposed to uh, free will. And so that is very interesting. Um, as Karen, I, I don't have the answer. In fact, I have the excuse of being a computer scientist. And if you, if you talk with computer scientists, you always have to explain the term agency. It doesn't, 
It's not a natural term that means something intuitively, actually, very interestingly. Um, but uh, luckily, in the agency project, we will have one person for three years, a postdoc, a philosophist, or, or maybe a culture specialist or media specialist, who will look at it in a very fundamental way, look at agency very fundamental. What does it mean? What does it mean in the different disciplines? What does it mean online? Uh, is it indeed about, is it, is it a, a notion of control? Is it control just for you, control for somebody else? Uh, your children or, or the elderly or uh, people you care for. Um, what does agency mean? And does it indeed mean free will? And where are the borders, uh, the boundaries uh, around that? Um, and uh, we hope to sort of address that in a quite fundamental way uh, with, with some of our staff in, uh, in the social sciences. Yeah. Along with kind of free will and an, an ability to make choices, something that's come up quite often in our discussions in this group is, you know, how, how easy is it for an individual to understand what they're signing up to and, and agreeing to? Um, and that's, you know, we've, we've talked about, you know, is there a need for standards or uh, coherent processes and activities uh, um, uh, kind of in the different ways that you interact with um, on online experiences or applications? Um, but, you know, with kind of that standards based approach, obviously you, you take away some uh, ability for organizations to, to kind of create unique processes for interacting with them. And I think this is one of the, the challenges I come across a, a lot in the, the work that I do. Um, and I know it's something that's been raised a lot in this group. Yeah, I, I think that's also part of, like I say, with this consumer duty framework that they put out, it's around that, you know, how do you make sure that people can understand what they're reading and then interpret and then make an informed decision, which could feed into a concept of agency. If you're if you're well informed, you've got choices, you can then decide which route. But again, as we come back to the sense of vulnerability, if somebody's vulnerable or is being coerced um, or comes under peer pressure, for, for example, how, how do you know that they actually really understand and comprehend what happens when they make a choice online and then that could have a, a dramatic effect on on their finances on their lifestyle etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah it, it's it's one of those it's a bit like trust it's it's hard to define it's hard to to make it broad and encompassing and that's what i was quite interested to find out about this consumer duty kind of bill from from fca because it, it is sort of talking about these things that now it's the responsibility of companies well for them in finance and if we think about the jargon and the, and the sheets of paper you get when you sign up to anything that is financial about repossession or how you're levying your finance i would imagine a lot of people don't actually fully understand it anyway and just go oh, yeah i'll just consent and we're back to the gdpr problem as well so trying to define and pull tease out of that is it true agency or is it just oh well if i want this then i need i need to sort of make a choice i don't fully understand it what are the consequences and i think this is part of what we're looking at uh, in, in part of this project so i i honestly think that a lot of people don't don't really understand what they're signing up for, what they're consenting to a lot of time online, the ramifications of that for them further down the line. And then you, you often hear people, well, if I'd known that was that at that point, I wouldn't have made that choice. And it's a, it's an obscure one. Yes. Andrew, uh, when you use the word standards, what, what do you have in mind? Sort of best practices or? Uh... Well, I, I mean, some of the things that, um, I've been looking at in sort of work with um, sharing identity credentials and claims, um, you know, is there a, a standard visual language that's easy to under to, to access when, you know, I know that I'm about to share a, a medical record or, an, a, you know, date of birth or, you know, is there something that is an easy yeah. hook for me as an individual that I can, without reading, you know, tons of pages of text understand what what i'm signing up to and and also not just you know in that instant um understanding that i'm sharing some information but what's going to be done with it how long is it going to be stored for who you know who else is going to have access to to it and 
being able to do that in a way that it's accessible for as broad a, uh, a group as possible, I think is, is a real challenge, but something that should be, should be looked at. Yeah, the standards angle is, is, is in particularly interesting. The, the, the standardized way of doing things particularly interesting. The way we um, address it in the agency project, our research in the agency project is that we have the designers, uh, two postdocs that, that work from a design perspective and do sort of a co-design setup where you would work with stakeholders. Um, and this element of the standards, standardized approach and not necessarily gets reflected particularly well in that kind of setup, uh, unless we do it purposely and think about it uh, and come up with, try to come up with standardized ways uh, that will translate to general context. Uh, so we will definitely uh, try to keep that in mind. Yeah. I had a question. So you had mentioned about smart home. How do you plan to go about solving for this with the smart home because when you sign up for the smart home capabilities I mean you pretty much are putting up all these different devices all over the house and whatever you're saying whatever you know they, they just keep on sucking in all the information you don't even have a clue what they're doing right yeah. first of all what they're ingesting and then secondly what they're going to do with it when and how and how they're going yeah. to use it yeah. How do you even go about uh, managing some of all of that? I mean, that, that trauma, I'm very curious how you plan to do that. Yeah, no, I, maybe I start and then Karen can jump in. It's, um, I, I, uh, I have a new house in Newcastle and um, I got one of these uh, Google ne Nest, isn't it? Uh, I didn't ask for it, but it, <laughs> it was put in and it was refurbished. And uh, I don't trust it one bit. And it took me about six months to actually turn it off while still being able to use the heating in a way that I, that I want to be used. <laughs> and turning the thing off was quite a job. It takes a computer scientist quite, quite a while to actually turn it off and still give it some basic functionality. Um, but the, the main question there is why would there any data go, uh, go to, the, to the provider there? Um, and of course, you can you can turn it off. Uh, I'm sure in some way, uh, but then you get to this enormous lengthy process that nobody understands. And so, in practice, a lot of data is just being shipped uh, to to these vendors. Um, so it might that might be a, a, an issue we're going to look at. It certainly is an issue we're going to touch on. Uh, we were also looking ahead at, at future homes where increasingly things are instrumented, uh, fridges, of course, but also um, the way the house is um, uh, facilitates uh, a disabled person to, to get through the house uh, in a supported manner with online elements. Um, uh, challenges like uh, insurance companies potentially knowing what data is, it is available and, and using that for their purposes, etc. So um, we we don't want to stick necessarily only with the current kind of smart homes, but look at the next generation smart homes. And in Newcastle, we will build some of those smart homes in the coming five years. And so we want to hook into the design of those smart homes. Uh, but I, I take your point and I agree with, uh, with that something should be done about that. Mm. Yeah, for, for instance, um, I also sit on a, a champions group around dementia and we've been looking as a group at uh, how, how can tech assist carers and dementia sufferers in the home. But like you, I've had, where well, we've sat and had various companies present their solutions, but a lot of them were working through, like we said, the existing technology. So all the data would go to Amazon through Alexa and, and a lot of other data would go to Google. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of Susanna Zuboff was like surveillance capitalism where, you know, the, the puppet master is just taking all this data, but what is actually being delivered to the actual person themselves to support them. So I think, again, the reason we're doing this project is there's so many question marks around current tech, how it's being used, who sits behind it, who is actually benefiting and, and selling data, is the support really coming through? 
for people to have a truly smart home. Like say, even if a computer scientist can't work out, you know, how 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 are these things working or who's have an informed choice on who's doing what with the data from the house then you've got to think as I did when my mum got diagnosed with dementia if my mother didn't have me as a carer how would she cope in in, in the current era mm-hmm. and then I think well if that's just one case but how about people with dementia who don't have a me uh, and are confused even more by by the digital home and all these gadgets that they're given. As I was speaking to one dementia sufferer, he said to me, well, it's OK, so we're going to give you these devices, but the box arrives and they have no idea what to do with it, what the implications are, what the consequences of using this, installing it. And um, I've spoken to many people and I keep control of my mom's finances now, but you see where... I think it's quite unethical that companies will all of a sudden just add packages to to people's bills and you're going <laughs> no, no, I actually need sport on Sky and, and things like this or other packages that, that really aren't applicable to them. And I've heard so many stories about that where they're taking lots of money. So we got to think about the concept of the smart home and exactly what's happening there, how we're getting meaningful consent and agency, how are people going to be able to choose across the, it's like the drivers of vulnerability that I liked from the FCA and Nikki and I have talked about before, which is like um, health, life events, resilience and capabilities. And I think this whole concept of agency really fills into sort of the resilience and capabilities aspect. If you really can't understand what's happening around you and you're just put in a situation that, oh, smart tech is going to make your life so much better, then we've got to really ask these big questions around does it really and i uh, say so we might be raising more questions and answers in this session but hopefully in in making awareness to to groups like yourselves that this we want to work with you because um we want to understand the space a bit more draw on the work that you've all been doing that i've learned via nikki and then say okay now do we how do we take it to the next level to make sure that you say these very things are are considered and actually pushed up to the higher powers of the, of the other partners that we're working with. And I've got ins into government, et cetera. So there we'd be able to feed into their bills and strategies as well. Thank you, that helps. You know, the, the one thing that while we're working on it and I don't have the answer is when we sign up for these services and they, they collect the data. I mean, the, the one thing that the companies tell us is that oh, we are going to use this to improve the services that we offer you in the future. We are going to gradually, continuously improve this using the data that you send. How effective is that? And, and you know, is it aggregated, anonymized, or is it on a personal level? And if it is at a personal level, then what are they going to do with that? And, and how are they going to tag that to me forever? Educate me, right? So those are some of the things I, you may want to consider as you work on this. And I'm happy to uh, you know, partner. This is very interesting work. Yeah, absolutely. I think they are some of the big questions we've got to ask about this. Because I go, probably like yourselves, I go to far, many, far too many conferences and events where it's just assumed that tech is the panacea and it just will resolve these. And everybody must understand how beneficial it is without saying, yeah, but who is benefiting from this really? when we get right down to it, we're just back to this old profit purpose debate. And it still still seems to me like profit is winning most of the time over a purpose to actually give someone agency, whatever we define that as in the end. But that like you say that if they are doing this, which you hear a lot of companies, oh yes, we need your data because data is good because data will help us improve your services. But I'm like you, like how will it do that? And when you question them, they're like, oh, well, we're working on that. A bit like us saying today, but they are, you know, that we're working on that. We're looking at continuous improvement and therefore everything is data driven. Um, so we need to do that. But I think there just need to be more communication and, and clarity on what does that actually mean for you and your personal data moving forward. There's no real clear clear markers for me whenever I ask that awkward question, which does make companies kind of twitch a bit. So I can see there's a couple of other hands up for Vikas first, I think, and then Andrew. Hey, thanks, Karen. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, Anita made a very excellent point. Uh, and while we know about the known uh, 
you know, well-known providers and well-known industry uh, champions out there, you know, who may be collecting data and using it in the unknown purposes and stuff like that, which we, you know, are always trying to find out. Uh, there are also unknown providers out there, you know, and they uh, tend to enter the market in a very uh, stealthy manner uh, ways. So one one event that came to my mind when when this discussion was going on was like uh, during the New Year's, uh, there was uh, last year, uh, you know, this 2020, uh, uh, when 2022 was coming up, uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, market noise on children toys, which are enabled by artificial intelligence. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and this is a scenario where, you know, uh, while you may know about the known tech, uh, as I've talked about his new home, uh, this is like unknown tech from unknown providers, and this is like under the stealth of uh, artificial intelligence in some way and form, right? Um, and who is collecting data? What is going on? Uh, nobody really knows. So, so we got to look at from this unknown provider kind of a uh, lens as well in these situations. Yeah, totally agree. Because I say I think it's a bit like uh, I said we have many focus on on financial sector at the moment, but it's like that. There's different levels of of regulation, and people can start up and not have the same amount of restrictions or oversight or governance that more established companies would have and I think the same thing it's a similar instance to that that you've got established companies using AI to our best of our knowledge in a reasonable manner that's overseen but then you've got startups who are just going under the radar of the regulation and like you say if people buy this if there's a demand that supply it and then it's a it's one of those cases if we only we'd known <laughs> that this was going to happen and we want to we want to move from that and i think it's also leadership as well we need to have a, a more courageous leadership to actually stand up and recognize this because i i think part of the reason we wanted to do this as well is, is you go to events and, and people tend to say the same thing oh yes we're looking into it we're doing this but you don't see anybody taking a lead from the bigger companies or the ones who could have more influence etc saying we really need to stamp this out we really need to find a way i just find they're waiting for the regulators or whatever to tell them what they need to do and then they sort of agree to do it whereas i, I would hope that it would move the other way where you know that new things are coming in that are unknowns and how how do they play out in the whole system of of causing the complex online harms because as you say that the ai could be doing anything in children's toys, which would be every parent's nightmare. You know, you give you give a child a toy and <laughs> be secretly filmed, and that could go off anywhere, or recording their data, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, there's it's um as I said, it's a rabbit hole once you start scratching and looking and going, where do we go? Do we look here, look here? And that's why we'll hold the workshop. So at least we get a focus around, you know, what are the knowns, what are the unknowns, how can we explore this? and make sure that what we do produce out of it can actually be used going forward for companies as well. Um, Andrew, I think next. Yeah, I kind of building on that topic a little bit was um, just the, the changing interaction models as well. You know, we've gone from kind of physical interaction models, people beginning to understand now kind of uh, screen based interactions, but you know, a good example with uh, smart homes and things like that we're moving to models where there's voice interactions where you might be agreeing and signing up to something in in a new mode of of uh interacting with a service and then also you know online gaming um vr ar you know this whole um new universe where you know through virtual interactions you can be signing up for things making payments without you know fully comprehending or, or understanding it um within mm. that context so i think how these emerging technologies and modes of interaction affect you know, kind of your agency is, would be a really interesting lens to take as well. Mm. And then we've got the whole metaverse scenario playing out as well, which I still haven't quite got my head around yet, but yeah. I'm sure other people will have done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point. Yeah. Anybody got anything else to add? Mickey? Yeah, I just wondered, so you're at the start of a, it's a three-year research project, is that right? 
yeah. what um in a kind of an ideal world when you were doing your visioning around this program what would you like to happen as a result of your research how would you like your research to be used by business by government by other researchers and what's your hope for the agency projects yeah so Karen also has ideas undoubtedly but um one of the things we hope for is that the decentralized architectures, including decentralized identity, will, will we are able to going to be able to strengthen that uh, and use that in in novel ways where uh, we, we indeed work with human computer interaction and design people to to make that more practicable and more meaningful for people. So that there's a hope there. Um, then we always like to end up doing something startupy or something commercial based on the technologies that we develop and um and that you can never really predict right it, it, it really depends on how things go so that's the technology perspective then from the law and business perspective i think um the main the main target is policy influencing uh karen maybe can say more about that but that's definitely something we want to do based on um based on our research with uh, the legal people and the social scientists yeah so i i mean you kind of captured we're working with the law so because i'm not a lawyer but uh or the implicate understand fully understand the implications that's why we brought somebody in from the law department so we can actually pull this together and have something that sort of overviews every point that you brought up today uh, as much as we possibly can to actually influence and say this is the way that policy should be going, this is what we should be looking at, whether standards come out of it, of VICAS or not, or, or standardization, as you said as well, Andrew, we'll, it, it's more, I think it needs to be more agile and fluid than that. And it, rather than just a standard, it needs to be something that can actually oscillate and go through sprints to change because nothing stays static in this space very long at all. I mean, every week, I think I read something different, <laughs> um, something that's changing. And this is the problem with policy. It, 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 it By its nature, it can't react quick enough. But if we can start to put ideas in front of ministers, which I've been lucky enough to do and say, even direct to, to groups like yourself saying, why don't you fund people who are already doing this rather than actually trying to reinvent the wheel? So this was one of my points at the beginning. We don't want to reinvent what, what groups like you are doing, but if we can take that knowledge and, and then take it up to another level through R&D as part of the project, that would be great. The outcomes, I'd say I would, I would like to see some sort of spin out, whether we can help the people on this core or people in your networks, and when we can actually give evidence-based um data and tools to people at a higher level who can make it happen and make it useful for industry around delivering to people back to Vikas's point it's not about the technology it's not about just policy driven outcomes but what can we actually do that will change people's lives and feed as an academic it's always about feeding knowledge forward and sharing that so but um, I, as Nikki knows, I also call myself a pracademic because I always want to see a practical outcome. It's no good just residing in a report or a paper. It's what can actually physically happen with people who have the power to influence what comes next and change their thinking. So it's uh, not, not exactly a straight answer because, again, these things change and emerge over the next three years. But... Uh, I think as Ad puts, we we definitely have a spin out from it that we could liaise with industry. We would definitely have, say, a toolkit or advice that comes out in a report to advise people what they should be thinking about when they're developing. And around CDR as well, I'm already part of a new movement called um, the Digital Responsibility Forum, which is like a floating resource for people to actually interact with us around the design. Because as Vikas will know, when you're starting up an organization, you probably haven't got capital or resources is to think about all the aspects that you need and, and floating resources like that are a practical way to draw lots of people. So that's made up of academics, consultants, practitioners yourself, entrepreneurs, so that we can actually draw on that knowledge while again, universities are catching up because we're not teaching these per se in programs and a bit like policy, it takes a while to get a program through all the hoops it needs to go through internally um, in a university. So there's ways to plug those gaps to make sure that we're safeguarding now and the future as we go through this next three years. 
And I think that's about all we can say. We, we've got no concrete answers, but we'll be agile in our thinking and be reflective on different pain points, look at other people's research from across the world that we've got access to and see how we can keep moving forward. That's wonderful. We've reached the top of the hour. Thank you both very much for taking the time and for a great discussion. Um, it is a real pleasure. Has anyone got anything they want to add before we close the call? I just want to say thank you very much for joining us. It was, it was great to, to hear what you're working on and I hope we can continue to, to stay in contact. Yeah, I, I don't see why not. I mean, we're we're probably um, always working in the background, but I liaise with Nikki quite regularly. So if we can we can hook up and get you involved in the workshops, that would be really good. Yeah, from my I'll, perspective, I'll, I'll, sec I'll second Andrew's comment. Uh, great conversation. Thank you so much, Karen. And, uh, okay. And likewise, I just see it as like a two-way learning process. We can understand what you're doing and then think about what we do as well. There'll be different things that have clicked in my head as well as ours. Let me take them away and take them to the group and go, we need to think about this. Absolutely, um, I think, yeah, that's good. Yeah, I think about the unknowns, Vikas, that's a good one. Um, you know, the unknowns of what's happening around AI and technology that would then impact on agency, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, thank you as much as this. Thanks to us, it's always good. Yeah, yeah Rob, the unknown unknowns from Nikki. Huh? Oh, yeah. absolutely, they're always there in complexity <laughs> theory. The unknown unknowns. Yeah, Nikki, thank you so much. This is awesome. Yeah, thanks, Nikki. Thanks for inviting us. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, really interesting to see at the beginning of the project, and I hope we'll be able to do a couple of other tracks through it. And yeah cross-pollinate with other other elements that are going on in trust over ip i'll i'll connect with you karen um and ard i think particularly some of the work in the concepts and terminology working group might be useful for you so um i'll be in touch okay thank you cool. take care guys thank All you right. for joining okay. thanks a lot take care bye, bye. bye.